Not everyone was born to be in the drinks industry. Our guest was, but he just didn't know how much. Until he just happened to sign up with Ancestry.com. I'm Susan Schwartz, your drinking companion, and this is Lush Life Podcast. Every week, we are inspired to live life one cocktail at a time by the best in the industry. Johnny Neal knew all about his father's connection to the gin world from as far back as the 18th century. But it took a membership to Ancestry.com to find out that the other side of his family was busy making whiskey at about the same time. Now with the success of Whitley Neal, he's making expressions tied to the culinary proclivities of specific members of his family, quince, raspberry, and now his own. He's here today to tell us how it all came to be. Upbringing was was varied. Uh, I was born in the northwest, so uh, in Warrington, Warrington General Hospital. I spent a little bit of time there, uh, perhaps four years, and then my parents moved all the way down to Devon in the West Country. So we grew up on a on a little farm just outside Exeter uh, in Devon. Uh, I have two half brothers, two half sisters, so it was a big family. But we all went down together. And it was a wonderful childhood. Uh, rural countryside, beaches not too far away. Um, I went to a little uh, prep school in Limpston, which is uh, a lovely little place, which also has the Royal Marine Commando training camp. And uh, I had a wonderful time at prep school, uh, enjoying lots of sport. Uh, my father was very sporty. He was an Olympic hockey player. So, oh, no way. So, uh, uh, and Captain Great Britain at hockey. So... We all grew up playing hockey. He was also uh, very good at tennis, played um, junior Wimbledon at tennis. And, and then, so we all um, played badminton and tennis and, and lots of things. So on the farm, we had a little makeshift tennis court uh, where we had family battles. And I invariably Did you also lost. play hockey? <laughs> Did you play hockey against each other uh, as well? well? Yeah, a little bit of hockey. Um, so I was the youngest. So uh, yeah, I used to get beaten all the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be careful of those little balls, yeah. you know, the I hockey know. balls. I know. Well, that and the tennis as well. So right. <laughs> inver- invariably I lost. But uh, but that was probably a good thing, you know. Mm. Um and so I've got two, I mean, I call them half brothers, I call them brothers and sisters, you know, we grew up together, uh, they're my brothers and sisters, so uh, two older brothers, two older sisters, um, uh, lovely, lovely family surroundings. Mm-hmm. And um, what did you want to study? Did you, or did you have any uh, proclivity towards something specific? Um, well, <laughs> I remember going to a vocational guidance thing, sort of when I was a teenager, because I didn't really know what I wanted to do, and I sort of trod the road I was quite good at languages so I was doing German and French and I got pushed into uh, looking towards German and business studies that sort of that sort of thing but I didn't really uh, fancy going away for a year to Germany I don't know why I just you know I was a bit of a home boy so I quite liked uh, living at home so uh, instead I uh, took A-levels in Gosh, can I remember now? Economics, <laughs> chemistry, <laughs> and German. I did take the German, uh, and I spent a little bit of time in German, uh, Germany, but over the holidays. Um, and then I went to university and I did agricultural economics. So how to run a farm, essentially, because we were living on a farm. So uh, I thought it would be a good idea, and it meant I could go home and, and do some stuff. But Did you ever think you were going to take over a farm? Uh, not really. It wasn't really. We, we rented out some of the land. We didn't really farm the the farm we, we lived in the farmhouse and we had some land and it was you know tenant farmers looked after the land so it wasn't uh, and it wasn't a huge place either so uh no it was just it was business studies essentially with a bit mm-hmm. of an agricultural background so i did that at reading university um who knew you would later be looking through botanicals and working yeah, with botanicals well, exactly then. exactly and you know it's nice to have a history of the countryside and and uh how to manage the countryside and foraging for botanicals and you know, uh, actually, one of the gins that we're we're working on at the moment, we're trying to uh, tie up a partnership with the Wildlife Trust in Berkshire, Buckinghamshire, and Oxf- uh, Oxfordshire, um, just to give that little bit back towards nature con- mm-hmm. uh, conservation and uh, and the wildlife there. So, so after Reading. What were, what were the plans? Uh, I know you worked in banking, yeah, but what is every, that whatever, something that yeah, you? Uh, well, no, so my father actually originally trained as an accountant and it was kind of a, I kind of got pushed into it. So I got a job uh, with uh, 
a friend of my father's. He ran an accountancy firm, small accountancy firm in, in Victoria, in London. And so I started off there doing my articles. Um, when was that? That must have been 1994. Uh, so my first year in London was doing accountancy, going on audits. Uh, and I found it. Uh, the people were lovely, don't get me wrong, but actually auditing is uh, was, was a little bit soul destroying, and and the worst thing was, I suppose, in those uh, you know nineteen eighties and nineteen nineties, you used to go and have a beer for lunch, um, and then come back and look at the numbers, and I was. I was terrible with the numbers after I'd been to the pub. Which is not years. so good for an accountant. No, not so good for accountancy. Um, uh, so, you know, I, even, even one or two beers. So, so that was... Uh, I guess they should give a, you a beer test. You know, before you're an accountant, they should take you, yeah. you know, see how well right. you do after I a few beers. Right. Well, and then I was very you know. good at university, but uh, <laughs> as soon as I got to work, it was uh, not so good. Not so I good. guess you, you were thinking that this was not something that really lit your fire inside. I think so. And you so. were looking for that. Yeah, and it was, all, yeah, it was, it was that. And then it was the fact that dad had done it and I was just doing exactly the same thing as my mm. father had done. I think he'd, be, you know, he'd got his job uh, with Ernst & Young and his father had known the guy from Ernst & Young as well, so they were schoolmates. So uh, I, I sort of wanted to do something a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it evolved from accountancy. I stayed in finance. So um, the first year was doing accountancy. The second year I went, uh, while well, I worked for Citibank for a little bit. Um, so the corporate world. Yeah, corporate world, but in, in back office to start with. And then I sort of progressed into, well, actually, I, actually one of my most enjoyable jobs was my next job as a financial analyst for a satellite home shopping company. So I worked for, uh, they were called Quantum International. They were based in uh, Soho Square. Uh, and what, I was 23. Um you know, still pretty young. Pretty young, uh, and it was you know it, the, it was a, almost a startup company. I think there were, I think I was the twentieth person to join, and, and a year later there were eighty of us, and we were selling Sun Tiger sunglasses and ab rollers and Astonish uh, car creams and things like that. I mean, I was doing the the analysis of the uh, of the numbers, but obviously the sales were incredible for for these 20 minute infomercials that we were sticking on sticking on um, shopping channels and things so we were selling globally um we had an office in new zealand as well so i got the opportunity to go and work for six months in new zealand oh, fantastic. So I, I went to auckland uh which was great i uh, saw the countryside there didn't realize i had family out there which i'll tell you about later because <laughs> um, we're doing a, a little project with some family out there now um so Auckland uh, was great, and it was just before the America's Cup had, had uh, happened. So uh, everything was gearing up for that. Um, so so the city was quite buzzy as well. Um, but I but I also yeah I missed London actually. I'd say I love London. So mm-hmm. um, came back and I I thought I'd better f- uh, finish off my accountancy exams, get some qualifications, and then and then start looking for jobs. So. Uh, I came back and I studied for a year, took my management accountancy exams, and then I got a job with um, a city firm called Henderson Global Investors. So you were on, on the track to doing this? I was, and, and I was in there, and I was a portfolio analyst for uh, the property fund. So we used to look after all the big insurance company property funds, Pearl Assurance, London Life, uh, MPI. And I used to do the benchmarking and... Uh, portfolio attribution on on those properties. So I'm a qualified management accountant, but um, just not a very good accountant. Well, I have a question about the accountancy. Mm. Yeah. Was and now that you're making gin, do you find that you are using something that you got bored of, or you know, obviously you moved on to do something else? But do you find yourself using those those skills? That you learn then? Uh, certainly in the initial phases of, of building a business, you need those accountancy skills. Uh, you know, whether it's, you know, constructing the P&L, looking at cash flow. Um, so that there are some valuable tools there, certainly from, from that thing. But I think the thing that excites me most is trying to create something new. So, Well, that um, was another thing I was going to ask yeah. you. Did you find that when you were working for that startup, that was what you yeah, kind of excited different. you? Because your face lit new. up when you were talking about that. New products. It was new products. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, exciting things. It's things uh, trying to sell to consumers, selling a story to consumers, I suppose. Um, and, and I suppose that's where I, I started thinking this is not for me and and I had all this history so my father's uh, and grandmother's history in distilling 
Uh, so we have um, uh, family background. With green but hold on for that. Yeah. Hold on for a sec with that. Now, while you were doing this, you, I know you have the family history. Mm. Is this something that you know, was always constantly in the back of your mind as we don't have that anymore, but, and we'll get to the story, but that I want to come back to this. Do you think? Yeah, I think it was. I, I think so. I think, you know, I never, I was never involved. Dad was there. His uncle was chairman. My great grandfather's managing director. I, I think there was, there was definitely something there. My father always used to talk about it. Um, and, and my, in fact, to be honest, the, the my initial, thought was to actually go down the brewing route and, and start a little brewery. So I, was, I started looking in Surbiton uh, for... Uh, was this while you were unit. being this a accountant? while I was still working, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so initially, I, you know, when I finished at Henderson, I started looking for brewing sites rather than distilling sites. So we had brewing and distilling in the background. So, I'd, yes, I'd, I'd always wanted to create something myself but using some of the heritage and history from the family background Mm -hmm. and it was always kind of spirits and 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 beer yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. no wine involved Uh at all i love drinking wine but um i think yeah i think my mainstay is actually i probably drink more beer than spirits um but i like just a traditional english ale or a a session ale Mm -hmm. something something three three point eight four point two percent easy drinking and then you can still see the numbers. Well, so. okay. <laughs> Had you known that then? Yeah, exactly. oh, oh, you might have not been here now, yeah. so forget that. Yeah. Um, now let's talk about the history a little, because you know while you grew up, um, it was always around. So can you talk about what was around? Mm. You know what was going on while you were younger and the history of it. I, I think probably my first memory of it was uh, an LP. There's a record actually. Um, that we have from from the old family company uh, because they um, created something called Vladivar Vodka. It was called Vl- uh, Vladivar Vodka from Vorrington. <laughs> I love uh, it. <laughs> uh, which is great. And we had this uh, big record, and you know, on a 33 RPM uh, that we used to play. I don't know if it had Elton John, Crocodile Rock and all the, all the things at the time. And it, but it had, you know, the green or Whitley name on it on the back and and Vladivar and we used to have a bit of Vladivar in the house and we always said uh green ores in the house or, or Bombay gin um so it was always there in the background uh there was always a reference to it you know there's a couple of portraits on the wall with managing director and that sort of mm-hmm. thing on there but uh um yeah, they're always in the background there. In a good, positive way? Yeah, oh, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I say Dad talked about it, but he, he, he was quite quiet about it. I think, you know, when he left, it was under a little bit of a cloud. Uh, and, and that said, I, I, you know, it was nothing to do with me, but I wouldn't be here if he hadn't left under the cloud. <laughs> um, so, so uh, but we always talked about it and he always used to trip up there because he was a hockey player. He played hockey up in Bowdoin, uh, just on the edge of Manchester there. So we used to have little trips up there every year to go and see all the old friends and, and everyone. So so we sort of knew the area. Uh, mm. And my actually, my brothers went up uh, to a boarding school up there for a little while while I was still, well, we were still down in Devon. So they, their father was still up there. So we visited there as well. So, um, But yeah, I think I think it was always a little bit in the background. Mm-hmm. And what what was it? What you know? Give us a little history of of um, your family in the, on that side. On that side, um, what they were yeah, doing and what he he left. Yeah, so he was uh, he was a director of a company called Green and Whitley, uh, which was at the time the largest independent brewer in in the UK. Uh, so I you know probably put it similar to what Green King is now. Um, and they were a big brewer, but they also owned a distilling company called G&J Greenall. Um, so dad was director of the brewery, which is the Wildersport Brewery right in the centre of Warrington. And then the distillery uh, is G&J Greenall. So he was a director of that as well. So director of both companies. But he was also the uh, chairman of the local newspaper, which is called the Runcorn Guardian as well. So, um, so he had lots of involvement mm-hmm. around the area. Um, his uncle had been chairman of the company for 20 years and his grandfather, so my great-grandfather, was a chap called John James Whitley, who I'm named after. So my name is John James Whitley Neal. 
uh, and he was the managing director for about 40 years and was the cousin of uh, Lord Darsbury, who was Gilbert Greenall at the time. So um, the Greenalls and the Whitleys intermarried in the 1830s. And that's sort of where the Whitley side comes from. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, I mean, Greenall Whitley is no longer a company. There is G&J Greenall. It's an uh, independent company owned by, I think it's the ex-CEO of Campari and, and an American investment banker. So, so you know, they, they have Greenall's gin. So when dad left there, that was where my connection finished with mm-hmm. Greenall's gin and brewing and, and everything. And how about the other side? The other side is is also alcoholic, uh, it, and it's uh, more whiskey whiskey led. So uh, my actually my grandfather's family, so the Neil side, uh, uh, owned a and we still have the brand name uh, an Irish whiskey brand called Gelston's Old Irish Whiskey, which is a Belfast brand. So uh, my great great grandfather, chap called Harry Neil, uh, was working in the Ulster Bank in Belfast. He was a bank clerk. Uh, he was the second son of a merchant. And so in, it was 1851, there was a gold rush in Australia in 1851. So he went to Australia to seek his fortune uh, and set up a provisions merchant supplying the miners. And, and all his younger brothers came out and worked in the business. And he, and he did really well out of it, made a lot of money and came back to Belfast with his family. His brother stayed. In he Australia. was so smart not to look for gold. Exactly. <laughs> he didn't go digging. He, he, he Yeah, he, made, yeah. Uh, he knew exactly what he was doing. Um, and then bought this Irish whiskey business in 1869. Um, and then the business continued up till 1949 when, when Irish whiskey mm-hmm, sort of fell mm-hmm. off a cliff. But also, I mean, I, you know, I've been um, doing some research. Uh, so his, so Harry's uh, grandfather was also a distiller. So we've actually got a distilling pedigree dating back to 1730 in Comber, which is about 10 miles outside Belfast. Did you know this side as well growing uh, up? I didn't. I didn't know anything about it. But we did have a couple of old um, pictures on the wall, which actually sit in pubs around Ireland now, which was an advertising poster for Gelston's Irish Whiskey. So, and at the bottom it says H.J. Neal Limited, which was the old... So you'll be walking company. into a pub yeah. and see the... <laughs> you would, in Ireland. In uh, Ireland? But not, yeah, not over here. But, um, and then uh, we've got a couple of brass trays with, with the old branding on and everything. So that that's why, you know, with with... What I've been doing with the gin and something new, something exciting, we, we decided to resurrect the brand uh, about three and a half, four years ago. Well, with all this excitement of wanting to start, you know, you're going to start a new phase mm-hmm. in life, you're giving up the accounting. There's a lot of kind of burden of history on your shoulders. Where did you think you would even start? Yeah, well, it wasn't just that as well. I had uh, I had children on the way too, so um, yeah, it was. That's a different kind of burden. Yeah, but... that was another burden. <laughs> um, I know what kind of burden I oh, was. That's a financial yeah. one yeah. too. But... Financial too. Um, where do, I, I, I I didn't know where to start. I mean, it was uh, it was talking when, to people. Yeah, when really? you started. Yeah. You know, gin was not what was gin it two thousand four or so? Yeah, right, right. Yeah, absolutely. Gin wasn't what it was right now it was no. kind of where it was when your dad left the business yeah it was all um, i think it was a little bit further ahead you know uh-huh. you, you know had uh hendrix you had millers they'd started things off 1999 mm-hmm. 2000 2001 so there was a little inkling but actually i i don't think that would have mattered to me i just wanted to do it um i was passionate about developing something mm-hmm. um so i was talking to people so Having done a lot of research on the brewing, I went and did a brewing course up in Sunderland. They have a, a fantastic brewing course up at the university there. Um, I came back and then it was just difficult to to find a site and then the logistics and uh, pieces at the time for one person alone to develop a, a small brewery was just um, mind-boggling So and, and quite scary. So what I decided to do was step away and and, and then I looked at gin and... I didn't have a huge num- uh, amount of investment uh, behind me, so I started looking at ways of doing gin cheaply to start with in terms of let's go and talk to the distillers who are making gin and create our own recipe and then develop it from there. Mm-hmm. And so we've evolved from that to now owning you know, distilleries and, and selling lots of bottles, but it was very much hand-to-mouth. And then, and then there was the exciting part, which was looking for bottles, doing the branding, uh, 
you know, trying to uh, develop a recipe, but then wanting to develop a story behind the recipe. So that mm-hmm. was that was the interesting and fun bit as well. Yeah. Well, yeah, you kind of you had some of the story already, mm. but the as for the liquid, did you even, did you have a recipe to start off with that you knew about or not at all? No. Um, and were you a big gin drinker? Uh, loved gin. Always had to make dad two martinis a night. So. Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, always, how did he like it? He, uh, he was wet. He liked his wet. I prefer mine dry, but um, he and was, a specific yeah, very gin. Uh, it was he. Well, he was always drinking the Green Horse gin. So yeah, at home. So I, mm. uh, obviously, I switched him on to Whitley Neal. But of so course, he, now <laughs> he was my biggest customer for a year and a half. So, but he, you uh, know, it's kind of sweet that he was still, you know. Yeah, no, on he brand, it. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, and supportive that yeah, way. Yeah, no, mm-hmm. very much so, very much. I think he was a bit, a little bit anxious about what I was doing, um, but um, but I think it's turned out okay in the end. Mm-hmm. So, so how do you how did you know when you had the the right one, the right recipe? Oh, uh, it took a long while. So it took about eighteen months to get mm-hmm. there in the end, and and, and we tried lots of different botanicals and different different storylines as such. So. Initially, I'd gone down a very much a more British route um, and, and hadn't been very adventurous. I just wanted to create a unique recipe and I had all this British heritage behind me. So it was, you know, lots of English gin heritage. And was it just um, you? Well, I was working it? with uh, a chap called Rob Dorset at, at Langley. So okay. um, Rob was really, really helpful in, in, in terms of us experimenting with new botanicals, distilling them on their own, and then and then us developing them as part of a larger recipe. Mm-hmm. Um, so he, you know, he was, uh, I mean, he makes some fantastic gin. So he was really helpful uh, uh, across that 18 months. There was a, another guy who uh, I must mention is a chap called Peter Mackay, who sadly is no longer with us, but uh, was instrumental and, and uh, you know, helped me over the first sort of four or five years uh, massively but also uh, you know dealing with dealing with Langley so um, the Palmer family own Langley distillery and have been really helpful to me so um, mm-hmm. but yeah it was uh, it was very much British 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 um, until we couldn't get the botanical mix to work and then it was well let's try something different mm-hmm. um, and then it was and then that's where South Africa became involved. All right, talk a little bit about South Africa. Uh, my wife is South African. Right. Her name's Nikki. Um, she's from Durban, uh, which is a little bit of a, well, was a backwater in, in South Africa. Uh, I think it's been voted the, the best destination in South Africa now for, as, a, as a beach resort. So, Did you meet here or there? Uh, no, we met in Chamonix. All right. Skiing, All right. skiing in France. <laughs> skiing. Yeah, All yeah, right. Yeah, That's yeah. very chic. Well, she was working in London uh, and we uh-huh. went out to Chamonix and we met there and, and then... Uh, uh, met, met back in London again. So you so, had been several times, I assume, to South Africa. I'd never been to South <gasps> Africa before, no. So uh, I, my, I'd i known Nikki for, what, six months, and I went out to South, South Africa mm-hmm. and visited. And, and I've been going every year for the last 22 years. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, fantastic. It's a, mm-hmm. it's a wonderful country. Mm-hmm. And were you the one to say, why aren't I looking at South Africa? It was, it was yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's you know because of the flora. We'll credit fauna, Nikki on taking you to well, South Africa yeah, in the first yeah, place. Of course, of but course. yes, it was. What do you it think was, was that kind of lightning moment that well, made th- you think? I think you know initially you've got when you go to the Western Cape and you've got Feinbos there and you've got this floral region. And originally I've been looking at floral botanicals and you see that this is indigenous uh, to South Africa. It's looked after. It's you know a full nature reserve there. But you've got things like rooibos tea and mm-hmm. buku and and uh, natural botanicals just just growing everywhere that are very different to the ones we got in the UK, um, and it's, it's stunning. The scenery is absolutely stunning. So it, it sort of the whole thing lent itself to well, why don't we try something from here? Mm-hmm. Um, and and that's where we started on the floral spectrum to start with. Um, but it was the, we we built ourselves a little core recipe and we were playing around the outside of that and these floral botanicals weren't really working with that core recipe which was had us a little bit more coriander and a little bit more citrus and then you must have been getting so frustrated yeah it was it was (laughs) was tough because we wanted a a point of difference we wanted a point of difference in terms of flavor and aroma uh, and then also the story so uh, otherwise we'd just be another Mm. another english gin you know so um so i i think 
in terms of numbers, we must have tried 24, 25, 26 different things that I brought back in my suitcase from South Africa. And you uh, think, oh, this next combination is going to work. This yeah. one's going to work. Oh, this is going to work. It was. It was a matter of uh, crossing them off. Uh-huh. Um, and then, and then you know, we stumbled across some citrus notes that really were unique and worked alongside the botanicals that we already put together. And that's the famous tree. The famous tree. Well, it's two. Yeah, it was two. So one was, well, in fact, the first one we, uh, I, I brought back, and, and which you'll, you'll get in the shops here, it's, it's called a Cape Gooseberry. Mm. Um, so, so that's bittersweet, aromatic berry. You get on desserts and garnishes uh, on, on drinks. Um, so that worked really beautifully. Got a little bittersweet flavour to it on distillation. And then, and then the tree on the front of the bottle is, is the bareback, which was just is iconic. So... As soon as as soon as I saw it, I was hoping. <laughs> I was Please hoping. let this work. Yeah, well, because when I first saw the tree, it was it was it was naked because it's deciduous. There were no leaves, there was no fruit, there was nothing. I didn't know what it was. And then I did a little bit more research, got hold of some of the fruit pulp, and and then we tried it. You try that. So it was really just you looked at the tree mm. and said, "I want something from yeah. that tree." Yeah. Does it make anything? Kind exactly. of <laughs> exactly. <gasps> Fab. Well, we tried everything else. Right. So well. like that, that one tree <laughs> that that is so iconic. I know. I know. <gasps> and so it did. It did have uh, the what is it? It's the seeds inside, right? Uh, well, it's the pulp that we actually just we just distilled. Um, it's a white pulp uh, that's slightly moist when you crack open the fruit, but we actually use the dried pulp, so mm-hmm. it's dried out in the sun, um, which is used. Uh, a bit like cream of tartar in cooking. So so almost as a thickening agent yeah, thickening, in okay. soups and stews and things in African mm-hmm. cooking. Uh, but also it's got this um, sort of like a lemon sherbet flavour on the finish. Very fine powder, but it's a lemon sherbet on the finish, which they'll steep uh, the pulp in milk or water for three or four mm-hmm. hours and, and, and then stir it and then drink it as a, a lemonade, bearbab lemonade, they call it. Um it's really different citrus, uh, you know, very unique, but but it has that lemon tang to the finish, which which actually just uh, when we distilled it was subtle, but but you know beautiful. Were you just like jumping up and down? Yeah, yeah, no, it was, it was really exciting. <laughs> I found it. it. Yeah, yeah no, it was. It was a eureka moment. So it was. Uh-huh. It was. Um, yeah, very glad, very glad we stumbled across it. And then you just went into action and started to distill? I probably bottled too many bottles to start with. I think uh-huh. we bottled 3,000 bottles to start with. Are you very enthusiastic? Very enthusiastic, thinking everyone's going to buy it. Uh-huh. Uh, probably probably should have stuck at um, a, a smaller amount. But uh, but we got through that uh, after a while. I think mm-hmm. Dad, Dad drank most of it. Um, <laughs> Parental but, uh, support. Yeah, and then, and then, and then, you know, you want because you want to get to a stage where you you, you start off, but you also want to be ready uh, to start. And I, I think when I started, I wasn't quite ready with the packaging and everything like this. So the packaging has evolved quite dramatically over the last sort of fifteen years. Where I had a, a clear bottle with a bell shaped, looked like a little bit like a pot still, uh, more more mm-hmm. of a whiskey bottle, mm-hmm. which which actually actually at the time was very unique for the right. gin market, but. You see it now. The gin markets are a plethora of colour right. and, and, and bespoke bottles. And I didn't have the investment at the time to to make my own bottles. So you, you buy them off the shelf and you label them. And, and you know, a, a lot of other guys since have been through the same journey. So um, when do you think was the time when you thought, oh, yeah, this is going to work? I mean, was it right from the beginning yeah. or was it a certain sale or think, you started working with yeah, someone? Yeah, I started working in the, in the on trade. So mm. I, did a, I did a presentation at, uh, on Trafalgar Square. There used to be a bar called Albanac, which is now, it's now a, a Fuller's pub, I think, right on the corner of Trafalgar Square. I think it's opposite the Hilton Hotel. Um, and we brought in some uh, heavyweight on trade bartenders and bar managers and and they seemed to like the story um i had some help from a from a spirits guru called in Visnevsky, um mm. and then i had a friend called sam Searle. um actually and i met um there's a a, a lovely guy who's got a, a blog called cocktail credentials ben reed who was actually in my house at school so <laughs> so we hooked up again uh so and they definitely uh one like the gym to uh I think quite like the story. So that was the starting point. And then it was and then it was cold calling. You know, you've got to go with your product, knock on doors, uh constantly, go back and knock on doors again and just keep chipping away. And then 
once you've gained a number of listings uh, within the on-trade, then you can start talking to the premium retailers like Selfridges and Harvey Nichols and, and people like that. And they were, they were very supportive and always have been. Um, and then I went up to a, there's a, a wonderful uh, supermarket chain up in the northwest called Booths, mm-hmm. EH Booth, which uh, everyone calls the Waitress of the North. I'm sure they hate being called that. Um, but they were very much right at the forefront of, of the gym what's happened to gin you know the he uh, pete newton who's the buyer there was an early adopter for gin so he uh he he took it on and so that was my first foray mm-hmm. into what i think they probably had 16 17 stores at the time um and then from there i had a meeting with waitrose after that and i got a waitrose listing and then it sort of it went, went from there and then it, and then it's the the struggle of of cash flow and uh, forecasting and then maintaining that on trade focus. Uh, I didn't have huge resources, so I couldn't employ lots of people. Uh, so that's something I've, you know, if I started again, I'd, I'd uh, get a lot more funding before I started. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what you had this one for a while, the mm. one um, expression. When did you start feeling comfortable enough to, with your business, to say, okay, this is doing pretty well? Let's try playing around with some other yeah. expressions. Yeah, I, I, probably a little bit later than some other people started. So our original is a London dry gin uh, through and through, uh, fully distilled. Um, it was about four, four and a half years ago where we started looking at developing um, what are now called flavoured gins. So, so probably yeah. about the time we met. Yeah, 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 exactly. So it's just beginning there. Mm. Uh, and, I, you know, the first one uh, that we developed actually was an elderflower gin. And then it was the quince. So the elderflower is sitting in a JJ Whitley range, which is uh, another brand. But uh, the quince was probably our first flavoured gin, mm-hmm. which actually the quince is a little bit more like a liqueur, although it's at 43%. Uh, we're using natural quince juice, which is adding sugar. And then we're adding a little bit of sugar on top. So something for your cheese board at Christmas and, and, and that sort of arena. From, from my personal perspective, but people are using it in cocktails as a replacement for pear or apple or the, you know those sort of liqueurs as well so um we started with quince and then and then we hit on rhubarb and ginger and and rhubarb and ginger is has just been phenomenal so it is it's bigger than the the original bottle uh by a long long way um i know flavored gins have yeah, just flavored gins kind of gone crazy exploded. yeah i mean um, but i want to go back to the mm, quince mm. because um i heard that that was really something that your father loved was a quince. It, it wasn't my father. It was my grandfather. Your grand- yeah. See, I'm sorry. No. I'm so wrong. Your grandfather. Yeah. Well, uh, he was he was in the army. So, and he spent time in Turkey and Palestine uh, in the war and just after the war. Um, and whenever we went round to his house, it was quince jelly or quince jam or quince something. Uh, quince everything. Uh, used to grow quince in his Did garden. you like it when you were little? Uh, it was, yeah, it was a little bit too much for me uh-huh. yeah uh but i love it now um you know um, and mum still has it when she has a cheese board out she'll have it and was stuff. that why of course i want the romantic yeah. story here it's the story no it's, it's it, it, <laughs> is know, that why you... i definitely i think you know from from the experience of having developed the, the first one around uh you know the family history and the story we were looking for links into the family uh so each expression that we developed has a little different story about the family tree you know mm-hmm. our, our original icon is a tree so we just thought we'd look at a family tree uh so quince is about my grandfather we've got a raspberry which my mother is scottish so there's that scottish note there so we've got scottish raspberries in there uh rhubarb ginger is bringing it back to back to england and, and very much uh the northern counties uh where where my great-grandfather grew up um what well, have we got? Sicilian blood orange, which is based on my grandparents' honeymoon in, in Sicily on the way back from, from... Actually, he was based in Palestine, Turkey, but he'd been in India before and, and they honeymooned in Sicily on the way back. So. Well, is this the time when you found out more about the Neil family? Yeah, I think so. Uh, absolutely. I, um, well, uh, <laughs> Ancestry.com, isn't it? And now, now I've paid my subscription now. So, so on one side of my family, it's very easy. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got a lot of, you know, it's all written down uh, on the Neil side because 
weirdly, in 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 the nineteenth century, I think it was nineteen late nineteenth or early twentieth century, the record office in Dublin was burnt down. So a lot of Irish families oh, no find way. it very difficult to mm. go mm. all the way back. I mean, you're looking at gravestones, individual graves, and half of those, you know, all, all the writings being uh, uh, wiped off now. So, so I, I had a little bit of a family tree on that side going back, you know, a little bit further than than uh, Harry back in uh, what he was around in the sort of mid 19th century, um, 1831, I think he was born. And then another two generations back. But then I was, then I found out a little bit more about the, his grandparents on his mother's side. So the riddles um, from Comba. And uh, so that's the Irish distilling side that goes back to 1730. Yeah. And when did you decide to start with the whiskey? Well, this is what you were saying. Hey, when when uh-huh. when I had a sort of a, a more solid foundation with everything else, um, it just seemed natural to have something else, a brown spirit, sitting in the portfolio. And Irish whiskies, like gin, been growing at a, a, a mm. fast pace. Got a lot of new distilleries, a yeah, lot of definitely. excitement globally about Irish whiskey. And we had this old family brand from eighteen thirty sitting there, redundant. So it you know dusted off. Um, it also, you know, selfishly speaking, it's quite nice to start talking about something other than gin for a little while. <laughs> Got to have a little break from gin. I love gin. Don't get me wrong. Uh, and you know, I'd love to. And, and I'd love to start looking at rums and things too. But uh, let's let's get some solidity to the business. And uh, I'm excited about the Irish whiskey, and potentially we have a, a distillery. Uh, we found a site for a distillery in Ireland, so I'm hoping by the end of the year, this year or early next year we'll we'll be distilling our own whiskies. Whereas at the moment we're still independent bottlers, right, like we were mm-hmm. in 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 the 19th century. So mm-hmm. we're not doing anything that we haven't done before uh, with the whiskey, and we're sourcing. And there's a big history stuff. of bottling, um, you know, definitely in Scotland and Ireland. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so you know, we've uh, and. and I think the most important thing for me on on the gins and the whiskies is transparency. So you know, quite happy to tell people which distillery we've sourced our whiskies from and which casks it's been in and why we're bottling it. This you know, so um, uh, similar to the botanicals we've got in the gins. You know, mm-hmm. Just be, be open and upfront mm-hmm. and honest. And you're also working with Marlebone. Well, you're doing Marlebone yeah. Gin with Marlebone Hotel. Yes. That's where I had it yeah. the first time. Yeah, yeah. Well, Marlebone. So, so I spent 15 years living in, in Marlebone. So, and my parents had a place on Paddington Street when we were growing up. So, uh, I've always loved the area. Always loved walking around it. And yeah, it's one of the best areas in London. I mean, I know we're in Kensington <laughs> now, but uh, there's there's already a Kensington Gin. So. Uh, why not? You know, there's a pleasure gardens there. It's got a lot of history of flora and fauna. So it was, it just seemed natural. It's just great to have a partnership with the, the Marylebone Hotel. They've been really helpful uh, and it gives us a little home. Um, so excited about the future of, for that. We, we uh, sponsor Middlesex Cricket up at Lords, you know, with a, you know, at the Marylebone Cricket Club. So uh, trying to do as much local stuff as we as Have we you realised that this is your history in that bottle? You've taken care of every other family member. I hope so. And this is your history. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. And and also, it's a, it's on a, it's it's slightly different to the Whitley Hill where we're we're infusing after distillation on some of the flavored gins. The Marylebone is very much back to tradition. Uh, the Blue Bottle is very much a, a traditional London dry gin, fully distilled. Our flavored gin. Uh, so we call it is orange and geranium and that is again it's for fully distilled gin uh, but the emphasis is very much on geranium uh, we mm. use Turkish geranium oil and, and sweet citrus um, and then we've we've got to have a little play with um, some rum casks as well so we've got our original gin sitting at rum casks and then we tried a, a, a little batch when we met last of, of cranberry and jasmine mm-hmm. so uh, that's that's experimental it may it, we may bottle it at some stage but um, who knows well, you're making me super thirsty. Can we open something and have a sip? I think it's, let's crack on. All right. Johnny brought bottles of everything to try. The original Whitley Neal, the Marlebone, and the new spirit that he mentioned briefly in the chat, the Berkshire Botanical Dry Gin. I asked him to tell me a bit more about it before we started making cocktails. I moved from Marlebone all the way out to West Berkshire. So I, I uh, live near Newbury now. And 
very close to me, there's a, a 9,000 acre estate owned by Lord Iliff, uh, which is called the Yappenden Estate. And they own the village of Yappenden and Frilsham and all the little villages around. And in one of these villages, in Yappenden itself, in the Royal Oak, we have a, a, a pot still called Harry. So my son's called Harry. Um, he was jealous that my daughter Isabella had a pot still in Maryland, so I had to get him a pot still. Uh, and so Barclay Botanical is based in Yattenden and it's based around the estate and pulling things from the estate, both in terms of the animals on the front of the bottle, but the botanicals in the bottle. So the Yattenden estate is the largest producer of Christmas trees in the UK. So our first... Uh, dry gin here uh, in, includes Norway spruce uh, from the from the Atten estate. So it's uh, we're just trying to forage and find things that are countryside led uh, and have some fun. And it's close to home. Uh, I'm hoping it develops into something uh, much bigger that caters for the whole area. And we have a range of different products, including rums and whiskies at some stage. But um, gin seemed the natural natural place to start. So, of course, our cocktail of the week had to be made with this piney spirit. It is still winter after all. Make sure you have pine needles on hand for this, our cocktail of the week, or it won't be finished without them. It's the Yattenden Martini, directly from Berkshire. Put all the following ingredients into a mixing glass. 50 mLs of Berkshire Botanical Dry Gin, 10 mLs of Lillet, and 10 mLs of pine cordial. Then stir, then strain, and pour into a coupe glass. Don't forget to garnish with the pine needles. You can't help but be reminded of the English countryside in every sip. You'll find this recipe, more gin recipes, and all the cocktails of the week at alushlifemanual.com, where you'll also find all the ingredients in our shop. I met Johnny on my first ever press night. I had no idea what a life that one night would lead to. I know I wouldn't be here now on this side of the mic, that's for sure. We ate a very Durban-centric dish called bunny chow, accompanied by a Whitley Neal cocktail. And that was over five years ago. If you live for Lush Life, would you consider supporting us by buying us a coffee? Just go to buymeacoffee.com slash lushlife and you can donate once or monthly to make sure we are still here every Tuesday. Theme music for Lush Life is by Stephen Shapiro and used with permission. And Lush Life is always and will be forever produced by Evo Terra and Simpler Media Productions. Which leaves me to say the wise words of Oscar Wilde, all things in moderation, including moderation. And always drink responsibly. Okay, the second part was mine. So next time on Lush Life, we have one of the stars of the bartending world, winner of the Diageo World Class Competition, former head bartender of the Savoy, and now owner of one of the sexiest bars in London. Yes, it's the one and only Eric Lawrence. Until that time, bottoms up.